work well. So we've got the we've got some concept of success here. In many environments, so here we've got our wide range of environments, and then the property of intelligence allows them to maximise the probability of success. So there's some there's a, some notion of some goal or something, some success, some whether they succeed or fail with respect to that goal. So you've got it coming out again, doing well in a broad range of tasks with empirical definition of intelligence. Great. Um, to act appropriately in an uncertain environment, so again, it doesn't know exactly what the environment is, where appropriate action is that increases the probability of success, and success is the achievement of behavioral sub goals that support the system's ultimate goal. Similar sort of thing again. Um, any system that generates adaptive behavior to meet goals in a wide range, or in a range of environments, need to be intelligent. So, hopefully, you believe me now that. While you may not agree with my particular definition of intelligence, at least it's not completely off base with what a lot of people are saying about this. It's an agent's ability to achieve goals in a wide range of environments. Okay, so if we have at least an informal concept of intelligence now, we've got some idea we want to get to. We sort of clarify that a bit, a bit, and I'm going to clarify this more later. Now, we don't have any practical machine that actually satisfies this definition. So, what are we going to do? Well, we could start trying to build a machine that do, can do that, and that's really hard. Um, one possibility is to try to theoretically study the problem, and say, okay, we're going to ignore computational cost, and we're going to try to come up with a theoretical machine which is intelligent. Now a lot of people object to this. A lot of people say, "Oh, but if you're ignoring computational cost, you're basically throwing the you you know you you're throwing out the essence of the problem." And yeah, I I accept that the the computational cost is obviously very very important here. But nevertheless, prior to this work by Huta, nobody had ever actually managed to even define such a system ignoring computational cost. And Maybe, and I think the answer is, there to some extent we have succeeded, maybe if you do study such a system and you formally define it, it's, you're no longer hand, waving your hands around, you can actually prove stuff about this, you can learn something about the problem. And then, once you have a theoretical machine and it, and it meets your criteria for intelligence, you can then think about, okay, we actually have something very explicit now. We have all the equations. How can we try to approximate this in a, an attractable way. And I, I think that's possibly progress, and history will tell whether that turns out to be progress or not. But at least we've formalized it. We've actually said explicitly what we mean here. And so there's some people I'm never going to convince about this. <laughs> some people really think that if you're doing this theory stuff with, and you're not worrying about computable costs, then you're wasting your time. But I don't think I'll ever convince them otherwise, probably. So anyway, this is what we're going to do. We're going to ignore computational cost. And then we're going to try to see if we can come up with a theoretical solution to this problem. Okay, so we're going to begin with inductive inference. Here we have a nice uh, sequence for you. One, three, five, seven. But what comes next? Nine. Nine? <laughs> we have a vote for nine. Uh, I hope most of you suspect it's nine. <laughs> so the question is, why do you think it's nine? One reason you might think it's nine, well, the, the standard sort of explanation, is that you've used a principle called Occam's razor. And you've looked at the sequence, and perhaps you recognize that there are other possible explanations for the sequence. But the simplest explanation is, is that you start with one, you just add two each time. And the simplest explanation is consistent with what you've seen, generally seems to be the most likely thing, right? And this is the philosophical principle of Occam's razor, and you've all used it. And, in fact, in intelligence tests, they expect you to use Occam's razor. They'll give you sequences, and you could invent some reason why it's some other answer, some complicated explanation. But they design it so that there is a significantly simpler explanation, which, which will give you the quote-unquote right answer. And so <coughs> even in intelligence tests, they actually expect you to use Occam's razor. And we're going to return to this later. It's not usually in the definition of intelligence, but I argue that if you really want to formalize it, you actually need it. And that's why it turns up in intelligence tests. So, 
The answer, what, nine, because you've used Occam's razor. And the simplest uh, explanation is 2n minus 1. Okay. Now you're all wrong. The answer isn't 9. I'm sorry to tell you. The answer is actually 57. Okay. And the reason why is that it's actually generated by the sequence here. This, this is the generator. Okay? Now, you can't be expected to get that right. But the intelligent thing to do is to use Occam's razor. And most likely it was probably going to be this. But you're, you're not sure. You don't actually know. And so this highlights a second important principle. And that's that there's actually an enormous space of possibilities. There's an enormous space of different um, explanations for things that you've seen. And you can't throw any of them out if they're consistent with what you've seen. If they're inconsistent with what you've seen, then sure, they, they can't be right. Because yeah, it's, what you've seen is impossible under this, this, this uh, hypothesis about the world. But you can't throw away ones that are consistent with what you've seen, even if they seem quite unlikely. So this is another important philosophical principle. It sounds quite obvious, but it, it is important. So we want to have a very wide range of possible, when we're we doing inductive inference, we want to start with a very wide range of possible explanations. We don't want to throw out anything that's inconsistent with what we've seen. And we want to use Occam's razor in judging which, which are the most likely things given what we've seen. Okay. <clears throat> So the, third, the, the second principle I, I came, I, I explained, was the Epicurus principle of multiple explanations. And that's keep all hypotheses that are consistent with the data. And if we're really serious about all hypotheses, this should be an enormous space. Okay? But if you're keeping all the hypotheses that are consistent with the data, you've got this wide, you've got this enormous space of possibilities, all kinds of crazy explanations. So how are you going to make sense of this? How are you going to make any useful predictions? Well, you use Occam's razor. And that among the hypotheses consistent with the data, the simplest is the most likely. Okay. Um, and then, if you want to formalize some of this process a bit more, we come into uh, Bayes' rule, which is the first of my equations here. Um, and essentially what this is saying here is that the probability of so, some hypothesis about the world, given the data you've observed, is equal to the probability of that data given the hypothesis times the prior probability of the hypothesis, and then there's some normalizing term. So we'll just ignore this down here. And so this is useful because it's not too hard, often, to figure out how likely is it that I've seen something if this is actually what's really going on in the world. Okay? And if you can work this out, and you have some idea of how likely it, this hypothesis was to start with, then you can figure out how likely your hypothesis is about the world. And so you've done inductive inference. You've gone from your data, what you've seen, to state, uh, distribution now over different statements about the world. Now, the, the really problematic thing here, this, this part here often isn't too bad. The, one of the really problematic things is where does this thing come from? This is the probability of some explanation of the world before you've seen any data. So how likely are different things before you've seen any data? And essentially Occam's razor tells you something about this. It argues that among all the hypotheses consistent with the data, well, you haven't seen any data, there's nothing, nothing to condition on, the simplest is the most likely. So if we want to build a good prior here and we believe in Occam's razor, what we want to do is we want to have the prior probability of different explanations about the world in proportion to how complex they are. Simple explanations are more likely, more complex explanations are considered least likely. Okay? So, in terms of uh, Bayes' rule, Epicurus says that the probability is our prior probability should be above zero for all H. So this, we're considering to start with this huge range of hypotheses and that H belongs to some very large set. We don't want to exclude anything before we even begin. And then Occam says that the probability of the hypothesis depends on the complexity of H. So what we need to do, if we want to really formalize this, is we want to say what this very large set is, and we want to come up with some measure of the complexity of the hypotheses. Right? And then we can actually formally, we can formalize both of these, these uh, philosophical principles and come up with some sort of inductive learning system that does that. Okay. So... What we're going to use is something called Kolmogorov complexity. And 
Turns out that Commodore complexity in this case is a little bit, a little bit involved. 